One, two, three. Okay, we're going to get started. <laughs> Again, we're going to get started. All right. So we this last session, uh, we're going to talk about um, practicing these principles in all of our affairs. Um, what is our message in practicing these principles in all of our affairs? So um, the 12th step I love. I love the 12th step. And the reason why I love the 12th step is because it has so much stuff in that one step. And the first part of that step is <clears throat> having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, which is a promise, which means if you do the work, you take these steps, you're going to have a spiritual awakening. I'm going to tell you, I would argue that you're going to have more than one. Um, I, I, I think I've had numerous spiritual awakenings. But that's a promise. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. We tried to carry this message to others in my program. Because <clears throat> we tried to carry the message to the alcoholics. Y'all don't listen. And I uh, <clears throat> can't hear it from us apparently. And I uh, tried to carry this message to others. And then the last part of that is um, and we practice these principles in all of our affairs. And uh, carrying that message to others, I'm going to tell you, um, uh, I love what uh, Bill C. Um, from California says. He says, um, we have a lot of activities and a lot of things that we do being on conference committees, which, by the way, is very important. And, um, uh, you know, being a group rep uh, of your group or a DR or whatever, and those are important, but those are activities. The only job we have is to carry this message. It's the only job we have here in our programs is to carry this message. And we practice these principles in all of our affairs. And carrying that message, what, what message and how do you carry that? Well, you know, uh, you can do that in a million ways. I mean, there's so much. Um, there's so many ways. You do it by, being, by sponsoring people. You do it by sharing in a meeting. You do it by chairing a meeting. Uh, you do it by doing stuff like this or talking at a podium. My least favorite way, by the way, just so you know. Um, <clears throat> but you don't have to do that. I mean, this just is, this just, well, like, he, like Cliff and, uh, was, it mentioned earlier, this is just our turn. This is just our job for today. Um, next week it'll be something different. Um, Working with others and, you know, talking, to, sharing in meetings, talking to the newcomer after the meeting, talking to the person that's been there for a while that's struggling, talking to them after the meeting or before the meeting. Um, and then I, and then I also in just living our lives, just how we, how we re represent out there in the real world, outside of the meeting rooms, outside of sponsoring and being around and, and, and being around the people in this program. How do we live our lives? How, what message do you carry there? I will tell you, there is a reason there's not an Allen on bumper sticker on my car. Um, because I, I gotta tell you, and I've gotten a lot better and I, and, and God is still removing that defect of character, but I gotta tell you, um, nobody drives correctly, I will just say. Um, and I am not one to flip people off. I am not one to uh, be aggressive and yell or any of that. that. But I talk to people in my car all the time. Um, <clears throat> they don't know that I'm talking to them. I don't know if anybody else ever does this. But, you know, I'm driving down the road and I'm like, do you know that thing on the side of your steering wheel? It's called a blinker. You might want to try using it. I mean, I do stuff like that spiritual stuff like that and so <clears throat> i have no I, I, it, it's a it's a character defect i will tell you um i've been more aware of it and more aware of it and um and uh, i think god is slowly removing that from me um but how do i present i was uh i worked at a radio station for years um when Cliff and I, after we got together and, um, for the, until he, uh, way after he got sober and I had a really good job and I loved it. And, um, and I left, when I left there, um, I went to go work for my husband, which at the time I thought was going to not be a good idea, but it, it's worked out anyway there. And, um, 
Cliff and I, I don't know how long Cliff had been sober and I had been in the program. I want to say about five years. And uh, I got a call from a guy that used to work at the radio station with me. And he was dating a girl and uh, she had a problem with alcohol. And it was making him crazy. And uh, he called me up and he said, now he didn't know I was in Al-Anon. And he didn't know Cliff was in AA, but he knew something had happened. And he called me up and he said, I need to know if we can go to lunch and I can talk to you. And I said, well, yeah, wh- what do you need? And he said, you know, I know that Cliff used to have a problem drinking and I know he doesn't anymore. And I know that you used to be a lot different than you are now. And I don't know what happened, but I need to know what you did because I need help. And so I got to meet him at lunch and 12 step him into Al-Anon and he did he came in he came to my home group and he got a sponsor and he worked the steps and uh he stayed for a long time and uh, eventually uh he he left I'm not really sure if he's going to meetings or if he's going somewhere else now but I had no idea um that he he knew just from seeing me from time to time that there was that much of a difference in me I mean, I look back now and I can see uh, how could you not tell because I'm like different as day and dark because I was not a good person and um, I was a crazy woman and uh, you'll hear all that later. Anyway, so <clears throat> so how do we practice these principles in all of our affairs? What's our message? I, uh, I always say that, you know, Whenever, if I go to the doctor and my doctor says to me, hey, Lori, you know, your blood pressure's up, you're a little overweight, you need to watch your diet. And every time that I sit down, I eat like I'm going to the electric chair. I am not practicing these principles in all my affairs. If I can buy a cute new pair of shoes, but I cannot pay my electric bill, I'm not practicing these principles in all my affairs. If I can sit in a meeting and be really kind and nice and look really good up here, but yet when we get back in the room, I start yelling at my husband or talking down to him, I'm not practicing these principles in all my affairs. If I sit here and tell you how great my husband is and how great our marriage is, and it really is. He's really a good guy. Um, Talk more about that. (laughs) And I, and, and I, I display this up here. But then when I'm home, I'm texting the guy down the row from me in the meeting or, uh, you know, flirting with the guy at the coffee bar. I'm not practicing these principles in my, all my affairs. If I, um, if I can, uh, you know, I don't have enough time to pay attention to my husband, but I have enough time to look at porn on my phone or whatever not practicing these principles in all my affairs. I know, steps on some toes with that one, but get over it. We have steps for that. <clears throat> but that, but that's true. We, you know, you got to, I, 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 I have to be an example. My sponsor told me way long ago, you may be the only example of al that anybody ever sees, and I have to pay attention to that. I can't go to the 7-Eleven clerk in a bad mood and um, be short with them and crappy with them and leave because she's not in the program and she'll never know. I don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know that somebody's not going to say, you know, God, that's in line that, God, I've seen her in a meeting before and that's not what she was like at a meeting. I don't want that. I don't want that. I have to be really aware of uh, how I act and how I treat people when I'm not in these rooms. Um, so, you know, when, uh, I don't know how to say this. Uh, They're grown, they can take it. No, I'm trying to. <laughs> um, I I don't ever want to be something that somebody sees and say, yeah, I, I'm not going to Al-Anon. If that's what it's like, I'm not going there. If, if that's as good as it gets, why would I do that? 
I, I never want to be that person. And I'm sure that there's been moments in my life that people have thought, ooh, you know. I mean, because listen, I'm human. We all have bad days. And, and that's okay. I'm not saying we have to act perfect every single day, all, every single minute of the day. What I'm saying is, is that, you know, we're tasked with a, with a, we're tasked with the responsibility of being an example in our program. And we, that practice in these principles in our, all of our affairs sometimes gets tossed away. We just kind of say it, but nobody ever really thinks about what does that mean? What does that mean to practice these principles in all of our affairs? What's that message? What what do we, what is that what does that mean? And I think, like I said, those examples that I gave, if I'm, you know, uh, if I'm not if not I'm not following direction and I'm just doing what I want to do anyway, um, I'm not practicing these principles in all of my affairs. I, uh, you know, I I have people that I work with, and everybody that works in our office knows who Cliff and I are and what Cliff and I are. And um and I don't I don't treat them any differently than I do than I would if we were in a meeting together. I mean I just don't. They know who I am, they know what I stand for, they know they know that I they know that they uh, I mean what I say. That I'm not going to say one thing and do something else. They they know that. Cliff and I work out together at this place um in Oklahoma City, and almost everybody that knows us, um, I mean, really, almost everybody that knows us, knows that Cliff's in AA, and they know that I'm in Al-Anon. Our neighbors know it. People down the street know it. I mean, we, you know, if we think that it's going to help somebody, and that's kind of what it is. If I think I, that me, people knowing that I'm in a program, if that's going to someday help somebody else, then I'm, I'm fine with people letting, letting them know. However, you need to be careful if you're going to come over to our house for a big book study because that means that everybody, all the neighbors are probably going to know you're in a program. Um, our neighbors, one time we were gone, I'm just going to tell this story, one time we were gone, uh, I don't remember where we were, and um, one of the neighbors had seen a guy and he was tattooed up and he pulled in this silver truck and um, apparently it was telling one of the other neighbors, they said, yeah, there was some guy who had tattoos all over. He pulled up in this silver truck. And he goes, and then he got out of his truck and he walked all the way down their driveway to the back of the house. And then he walked back around and then he walked to the front door and then he walked back and got in the truck. And I think we need to call somebody. And the other neighbor goes, oh, it's probably just somebody in AA. So there's no anonymity in our neighborhood. I'm just telling you. That's our tradition, not theirs. So anyway. But we work out at this place, and and we had decided that we were not going to tell anybody at the workout place that we were in AA or Al-Anon. We were just going to be regular folk there, and uh, and so we didn't. Um, and so uh, and and we just it was just the one place in our life that nobody knew, and and every almost every place else people know. And so we able, were able to keep that up for like, I don't know, three, four years, right? <clears throat> and, um, and this last year, we got found out. And uh, what happened was one of the ladies literally, because this last year we've traveled a lot. I mean, this last year has been really crazy because of COVID. We've had three years pushed into one. We've made up a lot. So we had a lot of weekends this year, which is, we always have a lot of weekends, but this one has been, this year has been extremely rough, rough, hard, lots, lots. That's what I mean. Lots, lots weekends. So Cliff goes into workout one day and a lady just that he's friends with that works out with him just comes in and goes, she goes, do you travel around all the time because you're speaking for AA? I mean, just out of the blue. Cliff's like, yeah, yeah, I do. <clears throat> and you know what happens? The next week I'm, I'm um, at, at the workout place, and as I, Cliff is leaving as I come in, and he's like, hey, so-and-so on treadmill 13, his son's, uh, his son uh, is uh, out there doing the deal, and he's starting to go to Al-Anon. He needs to talk to you. And, um, and you know, now... I'm sure everybody knows. I'm sure they didn't keep it quiet to the small little group. I'm sure everybody there knows now. But 
<clears throat> you know, he was able to ask me about meetings. He's going to meetings. He's still going to meetings. Um, and now I know, I know this, that somebody, when they need a resource, they're going to call us up. Because that's what's ever always happened. Whenever it is found out that Cliff does what he does and I do what I do, Cliff um, always usually gets a call. Hey, I have a friend, and he's got a drinking problem, and I don't know what to do. Um, a girl that I went to high school with, um, and uh, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I am not the same person I was in high school. But anyway, um, that I went to high school with, and we've kind of ca- kept in touch over the years. Um, and uh, she called me this last year, and her husband's best friend um, had a hor- has a horrible drinking problem, and she's like, I need to know what to do. And, uh, and I had to tell her, you can't do anything. Um, if he's ready, we can get him to some people that he can talk to when he's ready. But if he's not ready, there's nothing you can do. And uh, and and luckily, he did reach out and he went to treatment and uh, started going to meetings. And but she's called me in between to check to see you know what else you know what else they need to do. It's hilarious. They're so funny. The people that don't understand the disease of alcoholism are hilarious. She called me one day. She's like, "Should I buy him any books and send them to him in rehab?" I go, "You know, I think they have some there." I'm pretty sure they're going to get him the literature he needs. It'll be fine. Um, but we've had people in our lives that have come up to us and have asked us over the years, you know, um, we know somebody that needs help. Can you help them? Can you tell us what to do? Can you tell us where to go? Can you tell us who to call? Um, and that, um, and, and that's because, hopefully, it's because we're an example. And... Um, and again, um, you know, everybody's anonymity is individual and up to them. We, we've been, we're pretty open about ours um, because we want to be able to help anybody that needs help. And so I think that when you're, when you're doing this deal, um, God puts people in your path that you can help. That's what our job is. That's what our job is. And um, uh, I have... I've had the privilege of 12-step and people. I'm going to tell you, I think 12-step and people going to people's houses and doing a set, set down and 12-step and people has gone by the wayside. But I've, I, and especially for Al-Anons, I mean, I'm going to tell you, we do not get that opportunity very often anymore. Um, but because I've had friends that have had people in their lives that have had drinking problems and the and they don't know what to do with the families, they have called me and said, will you go, they want to talk to you, or will you come and meet with them? And I've gone to family members' houses and sat down and, and 12 step them and talked to them about Al-Anon and, got, and introduced them to Al-Anon. Cliff, um, in, in, he's an attorney, and um, in his line of work, he gets to help people a lot. He really does. And I will tell you, I always know when there's some family member in his conference room that needs Al-Anon because it's the only time that I get this call. Uh, he'll buzz me in my office and he'll say, can you come into the conference room? Which means Al-Anon is needed. That's what that means. That's quote code for Al-Anon is needed in the conference room. And, um, and I've had the ability to come in to uh, go in there and talk to family members. Um, he's a bankruptcy attorney. And so what happens a lot of times, there's a lot of family members who have um, given up every p- penny trying to save their loved one. You know, paying for rehab after rehab and trying to bail them out of jail and trying to get them help. And, uh, and they come and Cliff goes, I-, I have somebody you need to talk to. And uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, to talk to those people and tell them about Al-Anon. Now, whether they choose to take the help or and 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 reach out or again or not, not my deal. My job is just to plant the seed, tell them what works, what worked for me, tell them my experience. Um, I got asked this last uh, January. Actually, I got asked in November. It took me, I had to do it. The deadline was in January to write an article for um, the Oklahoma Bar Journal um, for the other side of alcoholism because they were doing a whole issue on uh, mental health, wellness, and sobriety and alcoholism. And um, they wanted the uh, other side of the story. Now, listen, I've 
told my talk thousands of times. I've done these workshops a lot. It's a lot different when it's going to be in print to people who are not in this program. I mean, they have no idea about alcoholism. or And it, that was a challenge for me, and I had to pray about that. And But I had some really good feedback from that. And, you know, again, it's uh, God gives me this experience, and he gives me this ability, and, um, and it's, it's really all him. And sometimes I get the credit for it, which is really generous, but it's really not has nothing to do with me. I just get to show up and be the vessel, and I'm, and I'm grateful for that. So I think that's all I got. <clears throat> Thanks, Lori. Um... So, kind of talked about our message with our families, our message with uh, people, in our res- our families in respective programs of Alcoholics Anonymous now and on, and you know, kind of talk what, what's the message we carry through our occupations and other affairs in our life. When when in my drinking days, I used to because I for the last three years of my drinking, I was pinned down at home. I, um, I like to call. Lori had this great job, and and uh, when she worked for her, she was she sold sports radio when sports radio first started taking off in the late nineties, and uh, she was the only woman salesman. So maybe her her world blew up, and she was making great money. And I like to tell people that's when I became a functioning alcoholic. I had a wife that worked, you know, and uh, in the last three years of my drinking, I just I couldn't even get out of the house, you know. But I was a real go-getter. I'd take her to work and go get her. That's what I would do. So. But I would sit at home and get mad at her. You know, in a drunken stupor, I would sit at home and get mad at her. And I don't know if you all ever have done uh, smart things like this before, but I would get mad at her, and I would go to her closet and get all of her clothes out, and I'd put them on the front porch. Everything. Backwards. Yeah, backwards. And, uh, backwards. and then, you know, have it out there being all justified. Then within the next 30 minutes, think, Man, but she'll be gone and go get them all and put them back before she gets home, you know, and put them back in the closet. And then she gets home and goes, why is my clothes all, you know, whatever. And so my neighbors get to watch a crazy man in their life, you know. They're, they get to watch this guy who's just like a whirling dervish, right, the tornado, mowing through the lives of people in the neighborhood. <clears throat> so um, sobriety comes, and, you know, in our neighborhood it was... Uh, when, when Lori and I moved in, we were the youngest people in our neighborhood. Now we're like <laughs> the top end. We're getting top heavy over in our neighborhood. And so we've got these hipsters moving in, you know, with little kids and stuff. And I've been doing a big book study at my house for 15, 16 years now on Tuesday nights. I've just always done that. When the pandemic hit, we did one on virtually. We did one on Zoom for a year. Uh, and a lot of, there's some folks here that used to come to my book study on Tuesday nights, but when we got, when that was all over with, you know, the guys were ready to come back to my house, and so we, we came back, and, um, so I got new neighbors in my neighborhood, and so the folks, uh, they live next door to me, to the west, to us, to the west, they have a couple little girls, and, uh, you know, on Tuesday nights, I have all, you know, I got like 20, 25 guys showing up at my house, uh, as Lori described, some of them full sleeved up, tattooed up, and you know, it, I, I just got guys, you know, coming to my house. And uh, so one night, uh, everybody's leaving because we always gather in the front yard after we're done, and uh, they're getting in their cars and going. And Chris, my neighbor, he's outside with his two little girls, and they're, at the time they were probably I don't know, five and three. I think they're uh, seven and five, whatever. It's a couple three years ago. Anyway, and so Chris comes over as everybody's leaving, and we're just visiting because I, I want to be a good neighbor. And he goes, "What? So what do you do? A Bible study on Tuesday night? You know?" And so you know, we come to crossroads in our sobriety and our recovery, and you know, I, I believe in it's my anonymity to do with what I please. I also believe the people that live around me and work around me and are going to be in my life need to know who I am. I just have this belief, my principle that they need to know who I am. So I said, look, man, this is the truth. I just laid it out to him and uh, shared with him about my journeys, you know, in a a short amount of time. Didn't keep him hostage. Uh, 
But so I said, on Tuesday nights, we do a book study, and these, these guys come over. And I said, listen, if they're, if they're ever a bother to you, if they park in, you know, in front of your house, just come over. We don't mean any disruption. And he goes, no, 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 that's, no, they're not any problem. I just didn't know. Said, okay. And uh, it was like six months later, uh, I'm out in the front yard um, visiting with the guys before they leave. And Chris comes back over. And he said, man, Abby's brother has got a problem. He had got arrested on his second DUI. And can, would you be willing to talk to him? And so, so absolutely, you know, absolutely I'll be willing to do that. You know, happy to help. About a year later, uh, and that, that kid, uh, I visited with him, and he ended up going to a group and is still sober today. So just pointed him in the right direction because really that's all we do we point people in the right direction we're traffic cops we, we don't we relay a message and we're up it's up to them to figure out whether they want to follow the direction or not. that's it but about a year later down the street across the street and down a couple houses uh, friends of chris and abby's bought a house and moved in they got three little kids and uh they're talking her dad has some problems her dad has her, and so she's talking to Abby about her dad. And of course, you know what Abby says to her: "You need to talk to Cliff. <laughs> you need to talk to Cliff." And so I talked to her, and I said, "Well, you really need to talk to Lori. <laughs> you know, you really need to talk to Lori. I mean, I'm happy to visit with you, but you really need to talk to Lori." And so Lori sat down with uh, with her and and had a discussion. And and her dad eventually drank himself to death. Um, but there was some solace in the fact in my neighborhood, people found themselves found solutions. No matter what happened, they found solutions. It's a part of the message that we carry outside into the world. What am I willing to share with people so that they might have an opportunity? I've got to, all of us have to decide for ourselves, what's the line for me? Where am I willing? And I'm not, you know, I don't go to the grocery store with a sign. I mean, I just, uh, but I find that God gives me the knowledge or the sense that this is the time I need to share that. This is the time I need to be transparent so that the message they receive is one that they know what to do. I'm a lawyer, Lori confess that uh i hope none of you run out of the room screaming uh when you know that but uh i was a guy uh, i'm i'm so full of fear and uh, insecurities um i just you know that bar stuff that's all politics stuff i can't and because i feel so bad about myself and you know i'm that guy that i'm inferior about all that stuff so i don't ever get involved in any bar stuff because it's just those people it's a perception of how I see me. I feel like I don't fit. I can't go there. Uh, I can't be a part of that. I hold a license, but I can't go be a part of all that. So I just, I just talk about those people. I don't know them, but I'm going to talk about them. Yeah. Old ideas. So I got sober. And uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm three or four months sober, and somebody calls me from the Bar Association. And says, uh, listen, your name was passed along to us from somebody that you want to be on the lawyers helping lawyers committee. Now, I never said that. I don't know who called them, but it wasn't me. Let me just say that. And that's our, and part of our bar association, that's the lawyers assistance program, for lack of a better word, made up of volunteers on the committee. And so I, I said, I don't know. Let me, let me think about that. So, of course, I went to Don. And you know what he said, you owe you owe. Of course, you're going to do that. And uh, so I had to call him back and go, thought about that. I think I can do that. And uh, so I started getting involved on in lawyer's assistance program. And I started to get me to meet those people. And uh, they began to, hey, will you come to our bar association, county bar? Or would you present a program on lawyers helping lawyers for our county bar program? And so, um, you know, begin to do that. And then the law school started calling me. Hey, will you come down and talk to our ethics class? 
about the lawyer's assistance program. I don't want to do that either. But uh, I went because I didn't even have to call. I just knew what he was going to say. I, yeah, I can do that. So I would go every year for the last, I don't know, 18 years. I've gone to the University of Oklahoma and usually at least once a semester and, and talk to the professional responsibility class about how I burned my life to the ground. And uh, I don't talk about Alcoholics Anonymous, but I talk about, you know, a message that got carried to me that I don't do that what I used to do back then and how I've tried to live by a set of principles different. You know, I respect the anonymity of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't talk about that, but I convey the message and talk to them about lawyers helping lawyers. And, and I'm going to tell you something over the last 18 years since I've been willing to do that against my better judgment. I mean, it is one thing to come here with my people because I can tell you of what a total horse's ass I've been and you go, yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. It's a different deal to go to a bunch of normal people and go, let me just tell you how I'm a jerk. Let me talk to you about that. It, I mean, it is uncomfortable for me. But every year that I've been willing to do that, within a short amount of time, I get some kind of call from somebody in that law school class who either knows somebody has a problem or that would I be willing to go talk to them? Would I be willing to do this would I, or that? You know, my dad has a problem. Would you be willing? And so what's happened is, is that through that time period is that there have been lawyers that have come through that program that friends of theirs have heard me come and share at their uh, that they have called me and said you know Seth's got a problem will you be willing to talk to him and of course we say yes right? happy to do that and uh, I've served on that committee for now 21 years and, and been involved in that and a few years ago uh, they we have this conference that happens in the summer it's called the uh, small it's the solo and small firm conference it's about a Oh, they have about a thousand lawyers. You know, that just single solo practitioners are in small law firms, two or three members. They have a big in the summer. They have a big uh, conference for them. And somebody came up with a good idea that maybe we could have Cliff come talk at that conference for those lawyers. Now, it's one thing to go to a law school to talk to non-lawyers, you know, because they may forget. They're you know, but it's a whole different deal to go and talk to your peers, really your peers. The people that you go sit in courtrooms with or people you have stuff on the other side of and and have to share with them how you've burned your life to the ground. And uh, I really didn't want to do that. That was the deal. I thought, this is the hard line. I can go to Don and tell him this. This is the hard line. And he's going to say, oh, no, you don't have to do that, man. That's, that's just way too much, right? And, of course, I was wrong again. And... Uh, he said, you have a lot to make up in that profession for the damage you caused them. And if that's the task that God has for you to do, then you need to go share that and make it okay for other lawyers to know it's okay to come in out of the cold, to come in out of the darkness. And so a few years ago, I, I went to this uh, a meeting that I did not want to go to and uh, share my tale of woe to those people, not mentioning Alcoholics Anonymous, but talk about the set of spiritual principles I found and that living a different life. And if you have problems, you know, please call us, et cetera, et cetera. And from that, what's happened for me is that, you know, I have uh, I've had this sense of wholeness with my profession. I don't know if I've helped anybody or not, but by going and being real with those people, sharing the bed wetting and the booger eating to the best of my ability, you know, that I'm willing to share. What's happened is I've, I've had some kind of wholeness has happened for me. I believe there's some help been given to those people, but by going and just being me, what I found is that uh, just like in here, we're not so much different. That we all have our own personal struggles uh, inside these rooms and those who've never made it here, nor do they need to. And through that conveyance of the message that I receive to people who are unaffected, seemingly, there has been some kind of wholeness made for me. 
this idea that it's not me and them, it's just us. And through that, people in my profession have reached out to me. One of the things I did, I quit showing up for court when I was drinking. I just wouldn't, I'd just forget. Because uh, if you're in the middle of a run, you can't show up. I mean, you've got business to take care of. That's why they call it a drinking career. Because <laughs> uh, it overtakes all other careers. So I had to go sit down with like 18 federal judges independently and make direct amends to them. Uh, and so, you know, and, and my law firm that I had at the time, I mean, there was like 30 people that worked for me. We got evicted from downtown Oklahoma City. I tell you this because it's hard to keep anonymity when stuff like that happens. You know, people know what happened to you. And I think through all that, you know, the de- the deal is, is that my understanding of what uh, this textbook and the program calls me to do is to be that demonstration, carry the message of what I was like, but more importantly, what I'm like today. To those people who are know nothing about Alcoholics Anonymous, so they can see what the book describes as God's omnipotence. You know, I remember I was about a year. I, I, the building I got evicted from, I went and made amends, and for the last eighteen years, I've practiced law in the building I was evicted from, because I went back and sat down and made direct amends and got got back in that building. They told me I was going to, have to make a bigger deposit this time, but I was back in the building. And I remember it was about a year and somebody came up to me in that bill and said, hey, weren't you the guy that got evicted from here? About five, you know. The demonstration of our principles, that message we carry to those who have no idea about what happens, no idea about what it is we do, the change in us, in our occupations that we take back into our lives, back into the stream of life, we take back the message that we have to deliver. Last year I got a call, I was, uh, I don't know, it was about October. This uh, this week, uh, right now, the, our bar convention is happening in Oklahoma City, and I usually go to it because I work the table and... and uh, the lawyer, you know, the lawyers helping the lawyers table, and which nobody really comes up to except for the swag, you know. And so, or they'll come up and they'll just get something, you know, without be in conversation and kind of grab something. Nobody, they don't want anybody to see them hanging out at the lawyers helping lawyers table, you know. But I, I generally work that booth. It's, you know, part of my obligation. And, uh, so about a year ago, uh, in October, the bar president called me. And he said, hey, are you coming to the annual meeting? Well, I said, yeah, I'm working the table. He said, well, are you coming to the luncheon? And I said, well, you know, I don't usually go to the luncheon. I'm working the table, and, you know, I, I usually just don't do that. He said, hey, I'll tell you what. If you'll come this year to the luncheon, <clears throat> I'll have a ticket for you. I'd really like you to come this year. I said, well, yeah, free meal, I'm in. Uh, I said, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. You don't have to do that, but thank you. He said, no, I really want you to come. I said, okay. <clears throat> um, and so there's a luncheon and there's a speaker, you know, some boring federal judge that talks about something nobody pays attention to. But anyway, <laughs> uh, necessary evil. And then they get to presenting the awards um, for the person who's written the best bar article or the person who, you know, whatever, whatever kind of. Um, but there's these things called the, uh, <clears throat> the President's Distinguished Service Award. And... Um, the president gets up and he's uh, talking about the Distinguished Service Award. <clears throat> These are people I talk bad about. These are the people I don't fit with. I mean, that's that stuff they do that I don't do. 
And he goes on and begins to talk about my history with lawyers helping lawyers. And uh, he presents me, he calls me up and presents me with this plaque for distinguished service to the Oklahoma Bar Association for my commitment to the Lawyers Helping Lawyers program. I tell you that not because it's important that uh, I was embarrassed, quite frankly. I was embarrassed. Because they think driving 200 miles uh, to see somebody is a big deal. That's Tuesday for us. I mean, we, you know, it's a, they think that's a big deal. And I don't discourage them from that. It's, it's how they perceive it. But what I began to realize was the message that I had been carrying to my fellow lawyers had changed. That I was no longer, it was no longer me and them that it was just us. This wholeness that I had felt and experienced because of the message you guys presented to me and charged me with to go practice these principles in my affairs and take that message and be the best version of me that I could be. That I could get there early. That I could stay there late. That if somebody wanted to talk, that I would do that. That I would welcome the new person, whoever that might be, the new member of the bar who was coming in, I, that I would welcome them. That I would do, if somebody called and said, hey, would you be willing to do this? Say yes, even if it was something I didn't want to do. Because you taught me that, and because of that, what happened, it turned completely of how I viewed my profession and how they began to view me. Our objective here, I believe, I think the whole purpose of this is this idea that Bob talked, that said, and what I mentioned in the very first session. It's all about love and service. That if I'm disturbed, uh, it's not, it's never them, it's always me. And Sandy used to talk about how do I become the least disturbed person in the room. How is it for me that I can come and sit with people that I, in my head, my whole life, I believe they're, it's me and them, and suddenly just be okay? And the edges that I've had, the rough edges, this old ideas, this insecurities, these how I see the perception I have over time with your help, God's help, and the 12 steps, have smoothed out those edges to allow me to be back in the stream of life. To carry a message to people, a demonstration of these principles to the people that I used to view uh, in the least light. To carry that message and just be the best version of me I can possibly be. I hope in some small way today that we've uh, tried to convey our experience of what that's looked like for us with each other, with our family, with our AA and Al-Anon families, and what it has looked like for us in just walking the stream of life as how we've done that. I know this for sure, that by exposing ourselves and by telling our stories and practicing these principles, we begin to affect people. We begin to have, make a difference. We begin to do things unknowing, planting seeds uh awaiting trees to grow upon whose shade we will never sit. Yet we continue to do these actions and we begin to carry this message. We demonstrate our principles to those here and outside of here so that they may too say, what happened? How did that? How did you do that? I have somebody. And I hope in some small way we've conveyed that today. So we are so grateful to be here. God bless. Thank you very much. to close this meeting with the Lord's Prayer.